Hey guys, Loman02. I uh, want to do a quick video series. Um, this is again Bug Loam, which is a deck that we've kind of uh, gone through quite a bit, and it hasn't changed that much. But the games themselves were rather interesting. Um, not, I think we pretty decidedly won both, but I, I think what's interesting about these two games is one in this one right here. And, and, and before we go into that, let me, let me back up a bit. So to go over the, the keep here, I mean, this keep is not phenomenal. Uh, but this is not a fast deck, and I figure if I am in the mid-range or control mirror, I'll be okay. I'm playing against Johnny Rowe. Sometimes he'll play White Weenie, but generally speaking, he does not play extremely aggressive decks. He normally tends to play mid-range decks, so I thought this hand was fine. Just kind of making a hedge against the person, the player. Um, if I was playing against a known like, aggressive deck, uh, this would be a bad hand. It'd be horrendous. It's just way too slow. Um, but we do have a ponder. Um you know that we, we get to use our uh, our our, um, our scry land uh, after after putting that down to kind of uh, clean up our top deck. Our top deck is not great; it's a bunch of three drops. Although intuition is kind of a, intuition is the engine, but we're looking to like cast that like you know two turns after it should be cast on turn three because we have a creature land which comes into play with summoning sickness and cannot be used. Then we have a tap land in treetop village. So really, what we're looking for is fast mana here. So we not fast mana, but lands that we can get down quick. So we get the Birds of Paradise online. Hope we get to Jace. Um, and Jace will be a card engine or, or damnation if our opponent, you know, builds up their board. Um, so we go ahead and get rid of these three drops that are on top, the Intuition, the Liliana, and, uh, oops, I'm acting like I'm playing this game right now. Um, and we go ahead and shuffle it up. Uh, find a Caracas with it, which is fine, but it's not really what we're looking for. I mean, it is on tap land, but it's colorless mana for this deck. He plays Life from the Loam. So this is what's actually interesting about this game. A lot of folks think, I think, in the format now that if you're in a lone mirror, like, the best way to win a lone mirror is to get to loam first. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily true. I think it's actually kind of false. I think it would seem that if you get to loam first, you'll win. Because, yeah, you'll go up on card advantage. But here's the problem with loam. When you're using loam, you're essentially taking turns off to do it. So unless you can make multiple land drops in a turn, you're not going to be in, in castling relevant. You're not going to be drawing gas with it. So I think where the power of Loam comes in, you know, and, and he's playing the rock. We're playing basically the rock splash blue. You really need a way to draw into gas. And I think, you know, when you, when you have cards like Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time now, or like stuff like Jace the Mystical, there's blue to draw into cards. That allows you to make up for the inherent loss of a draw step that you get when you take, when you pick Life from Loam back up, when you dredge Life from Loam. You're going to get more cards. Your capacity for cards is going to increase, which is not a bad thing. That's very good. It's very powerful. But you're not going to, per se, if you're loaming on a regular basis, get into threats that can end the game. So while you may be up on cards, it's really an irrelevant asset if it's not being transmuted into an effect that wins the game. So that's kind of how you'll see this game play out. Like, we did not have a loam hand, and by the end of this game, we're able to get to loam, but we don't need to. Uh, we just end it. So he plays out Hypnotic Spectre, which is an okay threat. What we do here is just bounce it because we don't really want to have to deal with that right now. We kind of want to keep our hand together. He goes quarters us. Uh, with Loam, it's fine, but I have three basics in the deck, so I've got some time on that. Like, it's going to take him four times of doing that. It's really just going to thin our top deck out. So Ghost Quarter doesn't worry me as much. Um, we go ahead and cast the Garouk out here, and then Heroes Downfall, the Spectre. He goes ahead and gets back his loam, plays out the courser, does not cast loam, pulls the dust our dust bowl from the top. We find toxic deluge, play the land from hand. That could have been wrong, um, but I actually wanted um, a a green based fetch land in the graveyard for crucible. I didn't want to use that black red one. We do mana drain the eternal witness because we don't want him to get back one of his threat cards. More than likely is reclamation sage, which is not something we want to bounce with chase. So we get rid of the two lands, keep the fetch, um, use the fetch from the graveyard, the green-based fetch from the graveyard, get Tropical Island, if I'm not mistaken. Um, go ahead and Treasure Cruise here, and then cast out a Titleist Tracker, um, cast out the Trophy Mage, finding the white-black Protection Sword, Sword of Light and Shadow, and then pass it back. Planning to make a lot of mana and a lot of cards next turn, um, and possibly overrun with Garruk. Um, so he makes a beast because he needs to stay alive here. We go ahead and draw with uh, Jace, uh, find a new fetch land, use the uh, blue-green fetch land, I believe find just a basic forest here, activate the treetop village, find a card, um, and then attack with all um, the treetop and the trophy mage going at Garuk and the tireless tracker after pumps towards his face, leaving the threat of pumps up, but with the expectation that we will Raven's crime him to drop his life from the loam out of his hand, 
and then uh, of course your crew fix after that. Uh, the reason I want to drop life from below his hands, I don't want him to uh, be able to, to to gain more cards next turn without having to fade his draw step. Um, just to buy time, really, it's tempo play. Um, I know it's not good value. Um, he actually has a very strong hand. Um, I don't know if he drew in a Titania or if he drew in a Tainted Pack, but he ends up having Tania, a Titania and uh, Tainted Pack. He's able to make uh, 10 power um, with Titania, um, not not quite 15, which is like the optimal use of it when it comes into play. Uh, because we have an active Jace on two counters, we just bounce the one token uh, and go ahead and use the overrun ability on Karuk. Uh, I believe he found an Abrupt Decay, which would have been able to answer a lot of things. Uh, probably would have answered the Tireless Tracker because it's the... I don't know. That's not even definitive. Like, it's either Tireless Tracker or Crucible World that he answers. I don't think it's Courser because I don't think he's really racing me here. Uh, our life total is low, but it's not low because of his actions. It's low because we've just been, you know, going to town on ourselves with our, our fetch lands and whatnot. Um, so, I don't know. You know, I I, I, uh, I think it's interesting that, like, you know, the player that had the life from the loan first um, and, and even Natural Order in this game did not win. I think... You know what the the distinction between rock based loam decks are and, and bug or bug based loam decks are just blue splash blue uh, loam decks is that the, the the blue loam decks are able to do have the effect they want to or utilize effective card advantage faster than the rock based loam deck is because of the the capability to draw into um, additional threat cards um, after utilizing loam to acquire overall card capacity just just you know hand size. Um, at the end of the day. So I, I think that's what you ended up seeing here. Um, you know, we're able to present threats while well. he is trying to go into a, a value-based strategy with Loam, and we just don't give him the time to do it, because if you give him the time to do it, he's going to win. He's going to wreck all of our lands, he's going to destroy our mana base, blow our hand apart, and he'll just eventually draw into threats like Titania and win the game. Um, but if you don't let them do it, and you just continue to present pressure, 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 and force them to answer the board, then they can't really use the Loam engine to gain value during the same time frame they're trying to answer your, your board presence. Um, so I think that was interesting. I think it was an interesting game. And then we'll, we'll go to game two real fast. Uh, game two um, was another non-loam game with this loam deck. Obviously there we could have found loam. We had, I think, Intuition available to us and then Mystical Tutor. So this is a keep. Um, it's actually not a bad hand. So we're going to go Overgrown Tomb, turn one. We see him play out on Mana Dork. I'm not a big fan of Mana Dork in, in Rock Style decks. And the reason being is because like I, Rock Style loam decks, I think, tend to want to have uh, cards like Pernicious Deed. Cards like uh, Gaze of Granite, um, Sweeper Effects, stuff like that. So I think what you're trying to do, you're more of like a Nick Fit deck. I think he's how to think of it. Um, well, this deck does not run Veteran Explorer, which is like the, the basis of that engine. You know, it's a Cabal Therapy and, and Pernicious Deed and, and, and uh, Veteran Explorers. Um, you're a big man of deck. So like, you know, you, what you really, I think, want to be able to do is, is answer the board Um so when you start looking at like one drop mana making critters, they're not the best. Now you even saw in the last game, um, well, correction, actually you, I think you saw in the last game, we had to blow up our own birds in this game. You'll see, we have to do some similar shenanigans with pernicious deed, but we are able to make it work to our advantage uh, because of how the deck's built. So he plays a, a turn one mana door, which is not a bad play. We play a turn one exploration, see a blue green land on top. I believe Hintrell and Harbor get attacked for one, which means our opponent's not really, doesn't have a lot going on. We play our, our fourth land, find our fifth land, uh, utilizing exploration to uh, build our mana base ra rather rapidly. Play out the Perndy just to have it as an investment card on the board, so it just threatens to, to do what it does at any point in time. We go ahead and attack here to see if he wants to trade. Obviously, trading's not great because we could just sit back and pull our stronghold this thing and draw an additional card every turn and get a 1-1 one -one back. Um, we go ahead and cast out the Thrag Tusk because it's a big threat and it takes a lot to answer. I believe he finds Overgrown Tomb here, which is interesting to me, which means he must just be choked on mana. Yeah, he finds, he dumps all this other stuff, which is are all decent threat cards, but he doesn't play it. He plays out, um, plays out Wasteland here, and then uh, blows up my uh, my Thrag Tusk. Um, so he's obviously afraid of me using that as a recursive engine, and I could do that, but I, I honestly, I have enough threats that I'd actually rather just kill him. Um, so we go ahead and uh, we, we Toxic Deluge to kill his elves, because the reason we did that is because of what he got with Tainted Pack. I think it made the most sense that he was on a mana choked hand at that point. Um, and he wasn't looking at Wasteland as a, as a mana source. He was looking at it as a spell to destroy my most relevant land, which is probably Bullrash Stronghold there. Um, he does have a Withered Wretch and a Shred Memory, uh, as opposed to using Shred Memory to find uh, Life from Loam, because Shred Memory um, is a Transmute-style card, if you're not familiar with it. Um, what it does is it, you know, it transmutes and allows you to find a 2-drop, which would be Life from the Loam, or it exiles up to 4 cards from Single Graveyard. So, it's not a bad card. Withered Wretch is doing a number to keep my Tarmogoyf in check. The problem here is 
I, I do have this pernicious deed, but obviously my Tarmogoyf is a two drop, as is the Withered Wretch. That is one low synergy effect of having Tarmogoyf in a, in a pernicious deed deck, is that, well, it does get very large in size, and its power is pretty immense for, it, it, it doesn't, it would never strike anyone as like, it's a vanilla card, basically, but I mean, the, the issue with it here is, is that pernicious deed, you know, if you tend to blow it up, it's, it's a small enough mass, ma or mana casting cost that against the aggressive decks, you're going to tend to lose it as well. <coughs> so what we're looking to do here with the beast token, and it looks like he's out of gas at this point, he just has Hypnotic Spectre and Withered Wretch, is we're looking to foment a double block, kill the Withered Wretch, and then blow up the Pernicious Deed on end step. Um, we're going to lose the beast in double blocks anyways, um, but if we blow up the Pernicious Deed, it puts enchantments plus land plus creature in the graveyard, but we'll already have a creature in the graveyard from him. For Goyf, which makes it a 3-4, which means it can attack into the Hypnotic Spectre. We do not cast out this Obstinate Bailoff, because our thinking is this. If he's on zero cards, he's going to have to block here because this thing kills him. Uh, he'll likely double block so he can get rid of it. So on the following turn, if he rips a significant size threat, like let's say a Primeval Titan, um, he can play that and then attack with the Hypnotic Spectre and lead back enough blockers to block the Goyf, or a sizable enough blocker to block the Goyf. Uh, but he will likely attack with Hypnotic Spectre, which is why I don't want to play the Obstinate Bailoff, because I would like it to come as a surprise to him if he hits me with the Hypnotic Spectre. So the Obstinate Bailoff comes into play on his turn, uh, generating two uh, attackers for the following turn, and thus if he does mize well and play like a big threat, I have two lethal attackers on the following turn that were unbeknownst to him until after his, uh, his uh, combat step. He uses the Withered Wretch uh, to, to get rid of everything in the graveyard. Um, goes ahead and double blocks. We allow the Withered Wretch actually to die because the, the Hypnotic Spectre we're trying to actively use as part of our own game plan here. And if he just mises a land like he does, then he won't attack. And then we'll just blow up the Pernicious Deed and make the Goyf big enough that he has to block with the Hypnotic Spectre. We get very lucky and we draw into a counter spell. At this point, playing Possum with the option of Bailoff makes no sense. So we cast it out here, leaving up two black mana. He draws into a Relic of Progenitus. I allow him to pop it because I don't think it's that relevant. And uh, he tries cycling, and then I believe he concedes here. Yeah. The technically correct play, play probably was to just uh, counter that Relic of Progenitus uh, because it represented um, it represented enough uh, 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 card types in the graveyard to, to make Goyf big enough. But I kind of wanted to see what he could get up to. Um, I was a little curious. I think in tournament play, I probably would have just countered it. And been like, all right, well, you have no other cards in hand. Like, even though this card's not good, it's it, it slows me down by one turn. Um, we draw into a Mystical Tutor here uh, before he ends up re uh, conceding it uh, during our main one. And, uh, and that ends up being the game. Um, so... Hope you guys enjoyed this very short series. I just kind of wanted to, to highlight it because I think it kind of does show like Loam, Loam does not Loam does not per se end games. It can. If you're doing nothing, if your deck is doing nothing and you're not presenting threats and putting the screws to the opponent, as I like to call it, then you're probably going to lose to Loam if you're playing a greedy mana base or a three or four color mana base. Um, you just are. But it is not an unbeatable card. It is not. I don't believe it's too overpowered for this format. I think there are a couple cards that could be busted in this format that we have, we have allowed, but Loam is, is, I don't think, one of them. I think it's actually a... I think it is is a card that, that allows decks like these to actually exist, and I think it's a, I think it's good, healthy for the format, and as you saw here, in, in the first game especially, it doesn't mean game over if you get it in the graveyard. Um, are there ways you could make it mean that? Yeah, possibly. I mean, if you're intuitioning it or intuitioning it into the graveyard with, you know, recursive 2020s, maybe, you know, but that's still two turns to get it online, another turn to activate it, and then another turn to attack with it. So, like, you're looking at, like, 3.5 turns to, like, get that to work, and there's a lot of time for the opponent to interact with that in a lot of ways, a lot of meaningful ways, um, and they may not even need to. They may just be able to attack you and kill you, like you saw in the first game here, um, so I hope this was actually informational for you guys. Um, I just kind of wanted to, to highlight this game set. I I, I know we, we won pretty decidedly, and like I, I don't think they were per se great games, um, but I think they highlight uh, the the fact that that having loam first in a mirror in a loam mirror is not the end all be all. Um, and yeah, he could have gone into recursion. We had the crucible to kind of stop that, but um, and I also hope you kind of see the difference between like crucible and in loam. Um, Crucible is a value is, is a value card. Um, it is card advantage. It's a lot slower than Loam. Loam is probably more powerful than Crucible. Obviously less splashable. Um, two mana is pretty relevant comparatively or compar in comparison to three mana. Um, but it, but it is not Loam from the standpoint that it is um, 
is I would like to call it a self-licking ice cream cone. Like, loam just puts more lands in the graveyard on its own. You know, it should, you know, when you're dredging five. Um, so, yeah, interesting interesting set of games. And I think there's some interesting interactions. Um, the games themselves, like I said, were not, I would not say extremely close. They weren't like great games, I guess, is what I, what I mean. Um, they were played well, I think, by, by Johnny Rogue. I think we played okay, too, but... But um, they were they weren't extremely interesting as far as like the gameplay and like how close the game was. It wasn't a race. Um, but I, I think it was interesting from the standpoint that the the, the low interaction came up. Um, we didn't have it. The opponent did, but it, you know it was still very beatable. And we're we're not even on a fast deck. Like if you're playing red deck wins like a fast deck. Like that would have been that draw would have been horrendously battered. Um, you know we're playing a pretty slow deck. Our threats are like four drops. You know we do have some goys. We have some like you know like very obstinate Bayloth and Garouk. But I mean those are all pretty big mana, pretty fair cards. Like if you get killed by them, like you see it coming. It's a haymaker. It's kind of slow. Um, but it, but it's it's fast enough if you're just trying to sit back and do do loam shenanigans. Um, uh, so realistically, like when you're when you're looking at like I think uh, the, the loam deck. Um, Sometimes you're gonna find like unless it's like a true control deck where like their their threats are like six drops, five drops, six drops, like sometimes just going for loam right away just isn't good enough. Like sometimes you need to to have an early basis of threat against the opponent to force them to react and then establish the value engine uh, of loam so that you can back those threats up <clears throat> with vast card advantage. So I hope this is at least interesting. Hopefully it was uh, informational in some way, shape, or form. And uh, this is the 100 Card Singleton format, guys. If this is your first time watching, I hope you guys uh, join us uh, for the Chainsaw Massacre. It is an event run on Gatherling.com. I say again, Gatherling.com. And it's a free event, uh, free service to register on Gatherling. And it's run every Saturday at 1600 or uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right, take care now, guys, and uh, have a great day.